We're about ready to embark on making our mold, and the most important aspect of this is planning. Careful planning will allow you to minimize mistakes that will be costly later. And we suggest that you make a plan of exactly what you want the finished product to look like. In this case, we have a, <clears throat> a round sink, uh, a single faucet knockout, and uh, we're going to put some inlays in. We're going to have a cutting board, which is inset, and it will allow itself to be nestled into the uh, countertop. So we're going to have this area in here is going to be a little bit recessed from the surface. So now that we have this plan, we go ahead and we make a reverse drawing. <clears throat> and in this case, the sink, which is on the right side, left-hand side, will now be on the right in the mold because everything is flipped opposite. And this is where our sink knockout will go in the mold piece, and this is where the cutting board knockout will be in the mold. So it's very important to draw this out so that you don't get confused when you're actually making the mold. From this, we formulate a cut sheet. And in this case, <clears throat> we're going to have uh, two pieces at 60 inches by 3 and a quarter, and two pieces at 26 and a half by 3 and a quarter, and then one large piece for the base, which is 25 by 60 inches. <clears throat> then we're going to have a cutting board. So that's going to be 38 inches by 14 inches. We're going to have a faucet knockout and a sink knockout. That comprises everything that you're going to need for your mold. If you're fortunate enough to have a shop, of course, this is a table saw. And this is the most convenient way to cut the melamine. Uh, another way to go about this is just have a cabinet shop make your mold. After you have these drawings, just have a cabinet shop make the mold. And then you can just skip this whole process and go straight to pouring. OK, we have moved from the cutting table. And now we're going to assemble our pieces at the pouring table. What's really important is to make sure that the pour table is very level and stable. So check, check your table. Make sure it's perfectly level, because that's exactly how your piece is going to come out. If it's tilted, then the concrete's going to tend to want to move in the mold. We want to perfectly level both directions. Yep, we're right on. And stable enough to handle the weight. Concrete is 135 pounds per cubic foot. So it has to withstand some vibration and also be stable enough to handle the load. Now, we have our pieces here. And I'm going to take a regular cordless drill with a Bix bit of the number 10, or a number 10 screw. And this will allow me to countersink the holes into the side boards of the mold. And I've done a few already for you. And I have a little piece of plywood here so I don't drill into my pour table. OK. Now we've countersunk all the holes necessary to assemble the piece. And we just want to make sure that everything is nice and square, that you've squared up. Everything on the table saw has been square. It looks good. And I have countersunk holes every six inches along the bottom of the mold. And then on the end pieces, we have our countersunk holes here, one inch in and 3 eighths across, uh, into the sides. Hold these tight. Again, making sure that you're square, everything looks good. OK, and we have a corner. What I have here is a backer board made out of scrap pieces from the mold making. And we use these to reinforce the sides of the mold. And in this case, they're countersunk in, just like we countersunk in the sides of the mold. And it's trued up. It's very square. And we countersunk along this face. 
and we're going to push this right up against the mold itself. Now, it just doesn't have to be absolutely accurate. It can just go within uh, three quarters of an inch of the ends. And it's designed to cinch up against the mold. And we just simply drill it down into the mold table and as well into the sides of the mold. Now, of course, you want to make sure your screws are not too long so they don't poke into the sides of the mold. That's not a good idea. So make sure that they're less than an inch and a half. Those are inch and a quarter or inch screws at the most. And that way, this is a nice tight assembly, and it's ready to place our drain board in as well as uh, begin the caulking process uh, around the edges to keep the piece waterproof and to uh, ease the edges. I have here the drain board knockout. And remember that we're going to orient this to our drawing to make sure that we have everything in the right dimension and in the right sequence. We're going to place this just as we have it in the drawing. You can see the drawing there. You can see this piece is going to go into the upper right-hand corner. On the drain board, what we've done is we've used packing tape, just regular mailing packing tape. And we've used a little bit of spray adhesive and sprayed along the edge and then put the packing tape on to cover the uh, exposed edge of the drain board. Okay, that will make this release easier. If not, the MDF here, this, this particle board material that's underneath the melamine, that's part of the melamine, will swell. So we've got to keep this pretty much sealed off. And that's a very expedient way of doing that. So we're going to place this right in the corner and make sure it fits well. And then take it out. And on the back side, I'm going to use regular black silicone and caulk it in. Then we're going to take this piece and carefully flip it over and place it very gently into the mold and press it firmly in place. Now we have the cutting board knockout and the sink knockout in place, caulked, taped, and we're ready to weight them down so that they get sealed nicely to the bottom of the, of the mold. And we will weight these evenly. So the silicone uh, will cure out, and we can leave these weights on it for a few hours, and that should be sufficient to give it enough tack so that these will stay in place. What I just did will save you hours of grief. This is packing tape that I've just put along all the screw heads to prevent concrete from covering them during the pour. Nothing is more frustrating than trying to find those screw heads when there's concrete embedded in them. So I suggest that you take this packing tape and you put it all on every screw head. Make sure that it's well covered. Now I'm going to take some blue tape blue masking tape, and I'm going to place it right along the edge of the mold, quarter inch away from the corner. And you try to be as accurate as you can, and really mush the tape down, go along. And what this is going to do is, when we go to caulk, this, your, your bead of caulk with your finger, this will prevent the silicone from smearing. And it'll give you a nice, neat caulk joint in the corner. So the 
edges of your concrete, finished concrete, build nice and rounded over. You go along and you do the same thing on the upper side. And we will continue to place it all the way around all the edges that you want rounded over. Okay, we're taking our black caulk, and we use black because it's easy to see against the white mold, and we're going to place it right in between the tape. Put a nice, even bead right into the corner, and right up. I'm going to go all along this side here. You don't have to squish too much in there because you're going to be working it out, tooling it, so to speak, with your finger, and that will force a lot of caulk out. So if you see a little white there, that's fine. You just simply wipe, and while the caulk is still wet, we just Peel the tape off. We're about to put in the inlays, uh, and I have mapped them out here on the drawing. A uh, little rubber hand, a little piece of uh, turquoise here, and a little piece of slate. Now, of course, you may choose anything you want. This is where there's a world of opportunity to be creative and put in any kind of inlays you like. Just for this piece as a demonstration, we're going to put these smaller pieces in just as accents. Um, a few little steel rod, pieces of steel rod, and this is a coin, and some tempered glass that has been shattered. It's very easy to do inlays. You just squeeze out a little bit of your black silicone, and you take a razor blade and the object, and <clears throat> just place a little bit of silicone. And of course, the more even and the thinner the layer of silicone, especially if you have a nice flat object like this, the more, the, the more likely um, it will look good when the form is released because it will be right up on the surface and you won't have to grind much away from the piece. So I just press it in. Let it hold. Okay. <clears throat> now this is a piece of turquoise that has been slabbed, cut in a lapidary saw, and it's very, very flat. And sometimes you can get pieces like this at a local rock shop. Just press. lightly. Okay, and I will continue to place these throughout the mold according to the map that I drew up. Oftentimes you can find really neat objects that you can put in uh, in the countertop and personalize it to your own taste. Once the caulk is set up, you can take a vacuum cleaner vacuum out your mold, and then take a rag, a clean rag, and some denatured alcohol, and wipe out the form. Okay, now we have another chance to exploit the creative potential of creating your own concrete countertop. And in a, the kit, we have included the Neomix semi-precious stone. And in this sack, in this case, we have serpentine and jadeite. We're going to scatter these throughout the form, and in order to prevent them from rising up once you pour the concrete, from order for them not to rise up from the surface, we use a spray adhesive and lightly spray, lightly coat the form. And it'll be just a little tacky, but that'll be enough for those stones to seat themselves on the bottom of the mold, and they won't lift. And you'll get more of the aggregate showing when we go to grind the countertop. Now, you can Obviously, forgo this step completely if you want to have a simpler countertop without these uh, stones showing. But 
we included these so that you will have a chance to see what it's like when you grind a countertop and you put these kind of stones. It adds a little, nice little special touch to it. Okay, so I'm going to take the uh, adhesive and just shake it up a little bit and then evenly spray across the top. And then just do enough that you feel um, won't dry too quickly on you. And you can see the bits of jadeite and the uh, lighter colored serpentine. And then just scatter it on there and they, you can see they're kind of stopping where it, they're stuck in the adhesive. I have the rebar, the reinforcing wire, laid out in front, on, on top of the piece right now. And we made this up beforehand out of pencil rod, which is this quarter inch material, and six inch electric welded wire mesh. This is easy components to buy in any hardware store. And uh, in this particular case, we have uh, cut out the six by six mesh, and we're going to lay this in right over um, the piece. And I'm going to use these pieces of foam to elevate this while I tie it off on the corners. So I've screwed these little screws in here and this will use some bailing wire and I will tie this cage into the corner to hold it up and then I'll pull out the foam uh, when it goes to pour. So <clears throat> I might check to make sure that none of the wire that is attaching uh, itself to the um, pencil rod is sticking out and hitting the sides. Okay? And we like to keep the uh, wire right about the middle of the form. So these pieces of foam are just about right to do that. And we're going to place the wire in each corner and in the middle. And in each corner, I have placed a screw into the pour table. And that acts as a, uh, an anchor for this piece. And we just fold the bailing wire around the rebar, keeping a little bit of tension on it, and then simply wrap it around your screw, which is screwed into the pour table. If you have a large sink area and you have a large span here and a narrow band of concrete which is supporting the top, you'll need number four rebar, which is half inch rebar, which is available at any hardware store. And you're going to have to get rebar across the front edge there and wrap it around just like we did with the pencil rod, except you'll be using reinforcing rod. It depends on the piece. Larger spans, you might want to go to half inch rebar. Smaller spans, 3 8 And in this case, with a small sink like this, quarter inch pencil rod is fine. Now, you might also have noticed that this uh, sink knockout is a little different than the one we used um, to make the mold for, it, for the mold making process. And that's because we use this a rubber mold for repeats. So we use these often in our countertops, and in this case, this is a rubber mold. And for you, you would be making that wooden round sink knockout, which was lined with tape. Okay, don't forget, you must remove the foam before the pour. So just take out the pieces of foam And now the rebar cage is held up and suspended by your bailing wire out to the outside. The form is ready to be poured. Okay, we're ready to mix. And before we mix, it's important to have as many things in place so that when the mix is ready, you're ready to go with the vibrator and uh, the screed tool. This is just a piece of the melamine that we ripped off and using as a screed. And that will go here using as a screed board. This is 
the ideal sized vibrator. It's a Makita cordless, and uh, it's the ideal size for the kind of work we're doing. Water. This is the essential element in our mix design. In order to achieve the right consistency, which is not an exact science, we have to be very careful about how much water we put into our countertop. I have separated out four and a quarter gallons between these two buckets. Now our range is between four and five gallons, so I've left myself a little room. Four and a quarter. It's about mid-range. I'm going to take the water reducer and put it into one of the buckets and measure it out. So if you read your instructions, it shows you that you pour one cup and a tablespoon into one bucket. Now there's some left over, and this will be for your slurry kit, and maybe you will have used some already in your sample kit. Mixers are available at your local rental agency, and they come in varying sizes. This one, for example, is a nine cubic foot. Now most of the time, your rental agency will have six cubic foots. That's perfectly adequate. We're simply mixing three cubic feet of material into a six cubic foot capacity, that's fine. If you can get a nine, it's a little better, but it's not completely necessary. You have both your gas and electric models. Either one is adequate. The gas is a little noisier, but it's a little more portable. The electrical is perfectly fine. Safety issues. Never stick your hand into a moving mixer. There's a lot of moving parts. Be careful around it. Make sure that you're always avoiding those areas where your arm can get compromised. Next step, break open the bags and put them in the mixer. Add the admixture. At this point, it's a good idea to cover the outside of the mixer because as the mixer turns, creates a lot of dust. We allow the dry ingredients to mix for 30 seconds. Slowly add the mixture of water and water reducer first. Now there's three characteristic stages to look for. When the mix begins to ball up and it's very dry and it's clumping. The mixer begins to shake heavily and it sort of makes a whumping sound. And that's still a little dry. Well, here, look, I found this piece of bad concrete, and we're going to just toss this out. This was part of a sack of the quickcrete that probably had some moisture in it. So it's a good idea to look through the mixer and find any consolidated concrete or already cured concrete and throw it out. We keep adding a little bit more water, a little bit more water, and the mix and the mixer becomes smoother. The action of the mixer and the mix inside becomes smoother. The concrete doesn't carry up on the tines and drop down. It sort of stays in one place with the tines going through it. Once the mix has reached the desirable consistency, we're going to now add the pigments. Now, as you can see, as the pigments go in, the mix is getting a little drier. So we slowly add water until it brings itself back to that original consistency, that sort of dense oatmeal. And you can see here in my hand that it, I can squeeze it, and the moisture kind of comes up as I'm squeezing it, and it falls away as I let it go. And that's about the consistency we're looking for. One way uh, we can handle this is if you would like to model the concrete, you take a little bit of color and you concentrate it and you place it in small patches and you can get a model to affect that way. For this pour, we're just pouring a monolithic pour. It's going to be an even color and therefore we're not 
we're not mixing in color unevenly. The hands are the first kind of vibrator. It's the best way to work the concrete around things like your faucet knockouts. You can just kind of work it in, use your fingers. It's a great way to get the initial set and get the co concrete consolidated down into those little nooks and crannies. Now when we're going to vibrate, you don't want to get the vibrator stuck down too close because it's going to disturb all the aggregate and your decorative inlays. So it's a fine line between vibrating too close to the surface and not getting enough vibration at the surface. We'll force the concrete in and then we'll screed to get it level. The first thing, always just use the fingers and work the concrete in, especially around delicate areas. You don't want air trapped around the faucet knockouts nor the corners. Now that's going to take care of the, the major portion of the concrete getting in and thereafter what we want to do is uh, make sure that it's well vibrated so that there are no air bubbles on the surface, especially. So the ideal form is this vibrator. It's just the right size, and uh, it gives about the right amount of vibration for a countertop of this size. And just lay it in. This is resting right on top of the cage. And you can see that the concrete uh, begins to liquefy under the vibration. If a uh, cordless vibrator is not available, and you do have your neighbor's palm sander, which is dis dispensable. Um, but just as a courtesy, we put it in a plastic bag so you can return it unscathed. And this is the portion of the area that I didn't consolidate with the uh, cordless. And I'm going to take this. Now, in order to get the sides, if you only have the palm sander, uh, we recommend that you place it at an angle uh, against the uh, side of the form to get some of the air bubbles off the edge. With the Makita cordless, it's not necessary. You've already vibrated out around the perimeter. Obviously, there's quite a bit of concrete here. We're going to gently screed across here, and uh, my assistant, Coulter, will start to remove some of the concrete as we find the true level of our form. So I'm taking the screed board, and in a sawtooth sawing motion, in a sawing motion, just going across, and uh, you take one sort of rough pass and make sure that you're always staying flat to the mold. All right? And this is just the first pass. It's going to be a little rough. But that sawtooth motion is essential so that you can get an even basis of concrete throughout. Okay, that was the first rough pass. Notice I went at slightly at a diagonal, okay? Now, I'm going to lessen the angle a little bit, and uh, you, you, it's really important to make sure that there are no rocks 
underneath the, between the screed board and the mold. So you really now are trying to level it. A little short motion, a little less angle. And you'll notice that this concrete is a little stiff and it's sticky. It's sticky because of the fibers and the water reducing agency. It makes the concrete stickier and more plastic. So it won't behave like concrete if you're used to ordinary concrete. It won't behave quite the same. Because it's a little sticky, the screeding process, a little trickier. You have to make sure you keep a rhythmic and consistent motion to get the excess concrete out. At this time, it's really easy to take your wet concrete and uh, get it out of these areas that you don't want it. So try to take care of cleanup right away. We still have our, uh, our bailing wire here, and that's holding up the rebar cage in each corner and in the middle. We're going to remove these now because the cage is floating in the concrete. Unhook these. Go ahead, you can unhook those. Okay, and just take the wire clips and clip those off just beneath the surface. Now your cage is suspended in the middle of the piece. It's not going to go anywhere from this point. Now the rest is up to Mother Nature. We just let it sit here and calmly cure. Now there's always going to be a little concrete left over. If you've calculated too tight, it's not a good idea. So we always have a little left over. We like to make a little mini countertop for the, for the daughter, a uh, little stepping stone in the garden, anything so that we don't wasting this precious material. And so I recommend making a little piece that you carry on the side just in case you have extra and then you're not letting this uh, concrete go to waste. After the piece is set up, you cut the baling wire. It's a good idea to place a blanket, a moist blanket, over the entire piece for between one and three days to make sure the piece cures well and hydrates. If you find that there's still some residue concrete left over, then we usually place that surplus on a piece of plywood so they can break up and throw it away later. When you go to rinse out the mixer, be sure that you do a thorough job of rinsing all the residue concrete, both the excess powder that might be in there and the mix itself and wash it down thoroughly. Get all, keep all the times very clean and take that water that's in the mixer and dump it out into your wheelbarrow and then take that and put it into a garbage can or a receptacle where it can evaporate. And then you can take the solids and dispose of them properly. Okay, this is the moment we've been waiting for. This is like a potter taking a, a piece out of the kiln. We have a, we don't have to have the kiln. We just let the thing cure for four days. This is after the fourth day. You'll notice here, there's a little bit of shrinkage back from the mold, maybe a 32nd of an inch. And that's a good sign. It shows that the piece is cured and dry. And along here we have Remember we put the cellophane tape and that's so to make it very easy for us to access the screw heads and they're not filled with concrete from the pour. My tools are laid out, I have a cordless drill, a couple of different kinds of crowbars, one small to get into narrow spaces, and a claw hammer, plastic shim just in case we have, get a stubborn side of the mold, and couple of razor blades for cleaning the fossils out. This may seem like a very simple thing, but it is an incredible labor-saving device, I can assure you. We used to just let all the concrete slop over, and we would be fighting trying to get the screw heads uh, out, out, of the, uh, out of the piece. 
But uh, in this fashion, it's a breeze. You can see how easy the melamine releases just from itself. Uh, it's no must. These can be cleaned up. Uh, you can use them again if you need to. So we set these aside. Okay, we've removed the last of the backer boards. And you'll notice this is the mold itself. And if you notice in the sink area, the sink mold has already been removed. Now this was removed after the first day's pour because they, we found that they're very difficult to remove after the four-day cure. So this spring-loaded uh, form has been removed after the first day. Now I'm going to remove all the screws that are attached uh, to the bottom of the mold and to the side edges. Depending on the conditions, and each concrete piece will be different, these will come off with varying degrees of ease. So we have prepared, of course, our crowbar and our wedges and a hammer in case it's very difficult to remove. Now let's just see in this piece how, how, how bad it is. I think I can just pull this off without any use of uh, a tool. And uh, here you'll notice the silicone, which was used to ease the edge. And this is when you get a first inkling of how uh, well you vibrated the piece. And you'll notice a little bit of the little bit of holes on the side, which are caused by air bubbles. That's fine. It really uh, adds to the look if you leave a little bit of that in there. So I'm going to go along, and I'm going to just try to ease off these boards. And they just pull away so easily and nicely. See, it's as simple as that. The melamine uh, is a very easy surface for the concrete to release from. So I just go around. And suppose, imagine if this piece was very, very, very difficult to remove. In that case, I would take um, the, the crowbar and start with the smallest one. And I would ease it into this uh, corner here and drive it, drive it like this, and gently pry. And then never, if you can, avoid uh, prying against the concrete piece itself. That's not a good idea because the concrete is young and it might chip off. So we ease against the form, the other form board and, and pry open. And in this case, of course, we have a very easily released mold, so we don't really need this tool. But I wanted to show you that just in case there was a problem. Uh, another thing is you can use these shims, the plastic shims. And, and if you get a really stubborn one, or perhaps you had some sort of insert in the front piece of the mold, and it's a little bit stubborn, you might take one of these and just wedge it, wedge it in, wedge it in, and, and then help ease the piece open so that you have a little bit of purchase and you can slowly uh, pull this piece off. Now this one is actually a little bit more stubborn. So I'm going to take my wedge and ease it down here a little bit. And so it just gives me a little bit of room and probably against the bottom piece is the best here. There. Now that's wedged against the bottom of the mold itself. And that helps me gently pry along and pull the piece out. OK, now that we've removed the sides of the mold, you can see the little holes that are formed by air pockets. And these air pockets, when you're vibrating the piece, they tend to rise up against the side boards. And they leave the little holes. Now, these holes, we like to leave them in because they give the concrete piece some depth and it makes it appear as a solid material, which it is, rather than trying to fill them in and keep the piece as a monolith. So holes along the side, to me, are desirable. Holes on the surface, however, may, may not be as desirable. And we, we have a way of coating those. And if you find these objectionable, you can then slurry coat over these pieces, and it's no problem at all. Now, you'll notice here that there's a little bit of streaking from the silicone sealer. Again, don't be concerned about that. We can just take a little bit of the diamond pads later and clean those up, no problem. There are two methods of handling the back, treating the back surface. 
of a concrete piece. One is to trowel it smooth while it's still wet, and the other is to grind it with a grinding wheel after it has cured. In this case, we ground it slightly, very lightly, after it was cured with this grinding wheel. If you don't have that equipment, then before it is cured, while it's still wet, you trowel it. You gently trowel it. And that will take care of a smooth surface. If you need one, especially for cantilevers, you might want this surface nice and smooth. Then I would suggest using a trowel and doing it while it's still wet. In this case, it doesn't matter. It's just sitting on cabinets. We used a grinding wheel and just lightly ground it. The last thing we're going to do is remove the screw to the faucet knockout. Okay, I've taken the screw out, which was attached to the mold itself, and now we're going to take the piece and flip it over, and then this faucet knockout will gently tap out. Okay, we have removed all the sides of the mold and the backer boards, the sink knockout, and we're ready to flip the piece over. And this is the most delicate part of the operation, so we have to be cognizant of the weaker spots in the countertop. The piece is cured for four days, but it's not fully cured. So we want to avoid torquing it or twisting it. And uh, in order to do that, we have some foam prepared so that the edges don't get compromised uh, when, when the piece gets flipped over. And we'll shove those under and keep our fingers out from the piece. And if you haven't gotten your neighbors curious and they haven't come over yet, grab some people. In this case, I have my assistants, Krista and Coulter. And we're going to push the piece over. They're going to help me lift it over and onto the foam. So I'll come out on this side. Krista, you prepared that side. And we're going to push the piece. Push the piece. It's not very heavy. It's easy to wash it. And always uh, hold on to the piece itself when you're flipping, not onto the mold, because sometimes it'll just slip right off, and uh, you'll break the piece, essentially. So I'm going to put the foam here. And um, they have a grip there. And they're going to flip the piece. Now, I have some space here for my fingers, right? So when the piece does come over, I can catch on to it. And there's some space here. And then also, these edges will get caught on the foam. So just go get some foam. It's, it's, it's a cheap way to save a very expensive piece. OK, let's lift Okay, here. Now, you notice it's going on the foam, and they're hanging on to these edges. It's going to be eased back. Yep. OK, I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. Bend your knees. And there we go. We have the piece now. And it's flipped over. We fully supported with foam, little extra pieces of foam around underneath the bottom and keeping it supported. And this is the crucial part now. We're going to pry the bottom of the mold which is now flipped over to the top. We're going to pry this up. And we have to be careful because with inlays, different inlays, there's going to be areas that have more resistance. And we don't want to just go to one particular area and just yank on the piece and pull it up, uh, knowing that perhaps over here is a drain board and a corner that might get trapped. And so in this case, we have a drain board running along here. And so I think that the piece will be most resistant on this corner. So I'm going to go back here and, um, and use one of our little pieces of shim and push this uh, a little bit in here. And I can see that it's pretty easily going in. It's slipping in. I don't think we're going to have a problem. And I'm going to just gently begin to pry up. And uh, if Coulter, if you'll help me here, OK, I'll just begin to lift. There, it released very nicely. And it's releasing nicely along here. Then I'm going to take this. And you don't want to just tear up completely like this. We want to try to keep it up evenly and take it off the piece. And there we go. Voila. Beautiful. Now, it's like a newborn baby. Um, they all look good, They, uh, even though they are a little ugly here. But these are where our fossils were. And the silicone, you can see they need to be scraped off a little bit. Don't worry, they all look like uh, this looks actually very good. There are no flaws. The corners are all tight. 
there's very little of the air bubbles, uh, air pockets on the surface. And you can see that uh, the, you can actually see some of the aggregate is showing on the surface. And our fossil and uh, little pieces of inlays here are uh, right on the surface. There's a little bit of bleed of concrete. All these will be scraped off with a razor blade. And uh, when this thing is lightly ground, all this surface discoloration will even out. Now we're going to just take out our faucet uh, knockout here. And usually they're fairly tight, so you might just uh, ease, it, ease it out with a little gentle tap with a hammer. And it uh, looks like this one's coming out very easily. So we'll just push it down, push it through, and voila, it's coming out. And uh, here we have the piece. Let me put that aside. Um, sink knockout is already. I think we're ready. And maybe I can have my assistants come and we'll push the piece toward the center here. Toward the center. And now the piece, make sure the piece is uh, fully supported and we might get some more uh, pieces of foam and especially around vulnerable spots like uh, areas that it's bridging. We want to keep some foam under there and keep the piece fully supported. Cure it in a kind of humid environment, not a real dry environment. And if you, if you live in a very dry climate, then you're going to have to provide some humidity, maybe uh, getting some wet towels and putting them around and, and putting a canopy over the piece so that it can cure in a, in a nice, humid, warm environment. OK, we're at the stage where we're ready to grind your countertop. It's been curing for two to three days outside of the mold. And we have in our finishing kit a series of grinding pads from 50 grit to 600 grit. And they come with a, a Velcro holder and uh, your 50 grit pad. And they're labeled on the back, 240 and 600. Now, there's a whole range of grinding pads, but we have included the ones that are essential to get the kind of finish that we think is effective for this kind of a countertop. So we're going to grind with the 50 over the whole piece to get to the level of aggregate that you think you want exposed. Once you get to that level, the other pads are for polishing and uh, finishing out. So don't expect the carborundum pads to do any deep grinding for you. You're just keeping with the, the diamond pad, and that's the one that's going to do the heavy grinding. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> one of the essentials for grinding is you use a lot of water. Uh, the water keeps the surface lubricated, keeps the grit out of the pads, and it will prolong the life of your pad. The diamond pad should last you for several countertops at least. These carborundum pads <clears throat> are a little more expendable, so we've included two of each for you in the kit. And should be plenty to do a countertop for the three cubic feet that you have in the kit. Also in the kit <clears throat> is included our wax and polishing pad, buffing wheel, and some nice little rubber gloves. Let's talk about our tools. This you can get at any tool rental. It's just a variable speed grinder. Uh, this one grinds from 1,000 RPM up to 2,700. You can go from 2,000 to 4,000 RPM. It's fine. There's not going to be a big difference in RPM as far as effectiveness. Uh, we will set this at about 2,700, almost maxed out. The other important thing is that you get a ground fault interrupter. And this should come with your tool uh, at the tool rental. If not, I highly suggest going to the hardware store and buying one. They're not that expensive. 
and they will protect you against any kind of electric shock should the tool uh, short out or should there be a short in the line somewhere that uh, this is a, a great safety device and it's absolutely essential because we're going to be in a very, very wet environment here. So make sure you have a ground fault interrupter and, it's, and you've run the test. And that also it is plugged into a three-prong outlet and that the outlet in turn is grounded at the other end. Uh, that's essential too or else you've Eff effectively uh, dismantle the effectiveness of the ground fault interrupter. Okay, so those are tools and the mounting pad we're going to place it on our grinder and there's a, a little button on this one that you press to stop the turning wheel so you can tighten it and uh, hand tightening is fine and these new grinding pads which has made this all possible are very convenient you place the grinding pad right over the velcro just sticks and we like to place it just slightly off center uh, if you place it dead on uh, there's not there's the, the grinding marks will show a little more it's slightly off center you don't get those concentric circles as much. Here's another essential piece of equipment that you really can't do without. This is my, uh, my down-home version of a water feed, a self-water feed. And basically what it is is a yogurt container that you poke little holes in, fill it up, you place it next to your grinder, and it'll slowly disperse water in front of your grinder. Uh, this is a poor man's water feed. If you can get a professional water feed at your local rental, that's great, because then it will be feeding water steadily from a hose. But this is a great device. Don't disparage that it uh, seems like it might not work. We use these all the time, especially when we don't have a water feed. So one of the first things I'm going to do is just generally wet down the piece. And um, after that, I'll fill my container. And then we'll just start on an area to give you a demonstration of how fast it cuts. And we'll do, we'll do some deep cutting in one area and then some shallow cutting in another. So there we go, a little automatic water feed device. You notice the water coming out. It's important to keep it filled. So every once in a while, it's a good idea to just screed off and take a look and see how much aggregate you have exposed, especially around your inlays. Now this is, uh, you can see here this inlay, which is a piece of slate, is very flush. And so you have a little bit of the aggregate showing. You might want to just stop here or you might want to go a little deeper. Now just keep in mind that if you go deeper, it means a lot more grinding. This is beginning to show some of the jadeite and uh, um, the aggregate that, that comes in the kit, it's just beginning to show some of that in there and uh, looks good, looks really good. Okay, it's important with grinding with a diamond pad to seek the level of aggregate you want to expose. And once you found it, just to go evenly across the entire piece at that level. It's really important to remember to be rhythmic and ease, let the machine do the work, don't try to force it, tip it. Just keep it as flat as you can and move with a rhythmic motion. It's sort of going a logical pattern like you'd mow a lawn, just back and forth gently. Well, we've pretty much 
ground out our piece with the 50 grit diamond pad. And what that's done, occasionally you'll find little air pockets that didn't get taken care of with the vibrator that expose the grinding might expose them where you didn't see them before. So we do have a solution for that. It's called our slurry kit. And with this slurry kit, we have plenty of cement powder and pigment to coat a piece. Even if you have some grievous air pockets on your piece, you can use this kit much like you'd use tile grout and fill those holes. So I'm going to take my slurry kit, carefully open it, and inside you'll find the pigment, little satchel of pigment in here. Now this is a, mixed to the same proportion as the color in your piece. And since we only have just a slight bit of air pocketing here, we don't need to mix this entire sack of slurry mixture. So I'm going to just take a small portion and of pigment and mix maybe eight to 10 times more of the slurry powder here to the pigment. Add a little bit of water. What we're looking for is almost like a toothpaste consistency. I might add a little bit more cement powder. Sort of like toothpaste. And if you wanted to, you could just put on the non-pigmented powder and you'd have little gray areas filling in here, much like the aggregate. In this case, we mixed up a little pigment, so it's going to be similar to the color that's on the top itself. And I'm going to uh, slightly wetten the area that I want to put. And if you have many holes over the entire piece, of course, you'd wet the entire piece. So in this case, I'm just going to spray, spray a little bit around the area. And you keep it, keep it wet so that not too much of this paste it's spread out all over everything. You just want it to go in the holes and be sort of lubricated. And I'll just fill in and take my glove. I'll sponge off some of the excess. Now, if you have to do your entire piece, if there's lots of holes all over the place, then you can just generally cover the whole piece, not filling in areas that, let's say, with this hand, you wouldn't want to fill that in. So you'd kind of be careful around an area like that. Um, and then lightly sponge it off. Leaving a little bit of the film there, it's okay, because then you want to grind the whole thing down and you don't want everything to be depressed. All the holes, you don't want them all to be depressed down. So it's important um, if you have a lot of holes to slurry coat over the whole thing. Imagine that you were grouting tile, basically. If you've had to slurry the whole concrete piece then allow from one to three days for that slurry coat to harden up and cure and then take the 240 pad and begin your final polish. After you hit the 240 pad, you go over with the 600 pad until you feel the surface is baby butt smooth and all the aggregate has a little shine to it. That's when you know that you've reached the maximum smoothness with the 600 grit. Now we're ready to seal our countertop. And we have provided a sealer from the Neomix kit that is a penetrating sealer. And it is designed to be applied with water and you saturate your top with the water before you apply the sealer. 
Now, as any penetrating sealer, it's designed to merely resist stains. There's no penetrating sealer on the market at all that will actually be stain proof. But this sealer with wax, in our experience, has been the best to allow the countertop to still have a tactile feel and at the same time give you some resistance so you can wipe up stains. So I'm going to pour some water with a sponge, saturate the piece, and pour a cup of the sealer with the saturated countertop and then move it around with a rag. So first I'm going to take the sponge and saturate the top. Make sure that the water is very clean and you've already taken care of getting all the residue from the grinding out on the sides of the piece and on the top. So you make sure you want to get your sides as well. And if you're doing this in your home, it's probably not the best place to do it is outdoors, but for our sake right now, we're going to apply it out here. And with a circular motion, you spread the sealer generous amounts. And the water helps keep the solution of sealer moving and it doesn't pool and bind up in areas so that it builds up a coating. We want this to completely penetrate and about you begin to feel that there's no more absorption and that the sealer is just sitting on top. And when that occurs, you starts to get a little bit tacky. You take your other rag and you begin to just wipe it off. Now we're going to repeat this process so that we get maximum saturation. You want to wipe off all the excess. And don't be alarmed. If it's a little milky, it's going to clear out. So don't worry about the milkiness of the sealer. So you've saturated the whole piece. You've wiped off excess. And then you repeat the process again, saturating the countertop. And you'll see that there's a light beating. Well, the sealer has started to take effect and you put on a sealer and then wipe it down again, wipe off the excess when you feel like there's no more sealer being absorbed. Okay, we're at the final process. This is the most exciting part. We're just gonna buff out everything. It'll show all your hard work will come to fruition here with all the nice inlays popping up. That's what our wax is designed to do. It's carnauba wax, it's a natural wax. It's the hardest natural wax available and it's non-toxic. Good around food preparation, no, not a problem. The surface has already dried out after the sealer's been applied for about three or four hours. Okay, so I'll take uh, a clean dry rag and uh, apply large amounts of the wax. And already you can see that it's going to bring out more color in the stones and in the piece. So I always enjoy this part. Now we're going to take the very same grinder with a buffing pad on it. The wax hasn't dried up too much. If it dries too hard, it gets a little difficult to polish out. So I'm going to take this and Okay, we're at the 
enjoyment stage of our process here. Look at this beautiful piece. It's all polished out, waxed, and you can see the, the nice articulation of the turquoise here and uh, the little steel rod and our natural aggregates that are inherent in the sacrete mix and then the jadeite and serpentine. Couldn't ask for more. It's a beautiful piece. Now, once you install it, I suggest that you go ahead and re-wax it, buff it out again. It's a good, good idea to uh, wax before you install it so that uh, incidentally handling won't uh, stain the piece and it'll pro help protect the piece during installation. Then afterward, give it that last buffing out. And once a month with a clean rag, just buff it out. You don't have to use the big buffing machine. Always just give it another coat once a month and that'll help maintain a beautiful, beautiful finish. And should there be an incidental stain here or there, that's just part of the patina. That can happen on a countertop, especially with a penetrating sealer in the wax, but it should resist most stains. Just carefully wipe them up as soon as you can. And after that, just enjoy it. Let it get used. It's part of the character of a concrete piece that it has a little bit of uh, patina that develops from use. And just like a wood floor, don't worry about it. Just enjoy it, and it'll develop and mellow over time. So there you have it, mold making to finish countertop in seven easy steps. The possibilities for creative expression with this material are endless. It's earthy, it has substance and mass, and it provides a wonderful sense of permanence, especially when created by our own hands. Hopefully, the more experience that you get with pouring your own concrete forms, the bolder you'll get with your own designs. I hope you enjoy your experience with Neomix as much as I have. Have a great time with it.